Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of the 286 Project. And on this podcast, we talk about arts, culture, politics, and sport, and anything else we can think of. Now, today's guest um, is a dancer, a choreographer, and obviously she's been in news with her own story, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, her name's Rosie Kay, and I'm delighted to have her on the podcast. Hello, Rosie. Hello. Hi, Chris. How are you doing? You all right? Oh, yeah, I'm very well, extremely well, in fact. Um, again, it's great to have you on the podcast. Um, I imagine most people know your story, but for those who don't, do you want to just give a quick summary of who you are um, and how you came to, um, how you are, where you are at the moment? Well, I suppose it's all part of a kind of trajectory, really, in that um, I was a dancer for about, well, I, I mean, I danced from when I was very little, from the age of three, and I didn't think you could do it as a career. Um, and then I went to an audition when I was a teenager with a friend to sort of be support for her and got in, but realised that there was more to dance than just jazz, tap and ballet. And around that time discovered contemporary dance. And what I particularly loved about contemporary dance, because I was thinking of doing law or history. Um, I wasn't thinking of that I could do a dance degree. What I loved about contemporary dance was this, like, this, this technical basis, but also this like you combine music, theatre, art, and politics, it has always had since its inception in about 150, 120 years ago, it's always had a kind of like radical, interesting political edge. And it's always been led by quite unique women, right from its, you know, Isadora Duncan onwards, Martha Graham, Pina Bausch, you know, all my heroines were female choreographers. So, so when I discovered it, I, I fell in love, trained as a dancer, as a choreographer, danced for like five, six years, almost gave up, ran a business, ran a wine business, which uh, was helpful actually, that you're selling selling a product. Uh, decided that that's it, that there was a point in my life, it was like, okay, I'm gonna have to commit to the thing that I really, really, really wanna do. But of course, when you commit to the thing that you really wanna do, you might fail at it. So it is a terrifying thing to do. But I committed to becoming a choreographer. And so for, Oh gosh, what would it be? 17 years. I built a company up from scratch, uh, from solo duet work, little tiny bits of Arts Council funding, right the way up to, we were touring the world. Uh, we were touring America before COVID. I was performing and taking my work to the largest stages in the UK, really large scale. And we were regularly funded by the Arts Council. So this is a kind of dream. And then, and also, I suppose, making you know, possibly what I thought I was protecting myself, but I never really consciously thought this. I, I just always gone for like an, an odd or controversial or difficult take on subject matters. Like I'm kind of like a cultural sort of Cassandra or something. Like I, I see what's coming before it comes, before it hits mainstream. I like to pick up on strange phenomenons that are happening. So I'd seen transhumanism coming up through the arts world. I'd seen how that had mutated into transgenderism in the fashion industry. And I then, because Theresa May had sort of put it up for debate, the whole uh, relaxation of self ID, I picked up that a lot of women, very intelligent women, women whose names I'd only just discovered, like uh, Kathleen Stock, Dr. Jane Claire Jones, Julie Bindle, these, these women, Helen Joyce was just sort of starting to write as well. These women were saying, hang on a minute, this is really serious. And I took it very seriously because um, I'd very much seen myself as a, a, a choreographer first and, 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 and a woman also, but I didn't put it front and center. I thought we were past that. But I was very aware, you know, my life has been shaped by being a woman and, you know, my life is shaped by, by bodies, you know, bodies are my media, my craft. You know, I, I know every, you know, I know as much as I possibly can about bodies uh, in order to be a good choreographer and a dancer. And I'm very interested in mental health, I'm very interested in the link to mind, the body, very interested in neuroscience, very interested in anthropology. You know, like I've really got this sort of wealth of experience behind me. So when transgenderism came along, I never, I never shut up about it. I was just talking about it all the time to everyone, all the time. 
And 10 days before big premiere of Romeo and Juliet, uh, which was, had taken me five years of research, I'd invited the cast of Young Dancers to my house. I'm gonna skip through this bit. We had a dinner, everyone was drinking. I was asked what my next show was. It was based on Orlando, which uh, the hero changes from a, a male aristocrat to a female aristocrat. Mm -hmm. And that has big implications on what he, she can inherit. And uh, there was an argument then ensued about whether that should be played by a trans or a, uh, well, I, I mean, I, I didn't know, it could be male, it could be female, it could be trans. Honestly, didn't know it just had to be somebody extraordinary, but it but it opened the subject. They asked me my opinions, and I talked about the very extremes of where this erasure of women in law and sex in law, both for women and for children, where it could have devastating consequences, of which, of course, have been proven right. But for some, I, I had no idea they were um, true believers or zealots. I'd no belief no idea that they were activists. They really went for me. They really went for me. I was absolutely devastated, like completely um, paralyzed actually, because I'm making a show and I care about my dancers, like I really do. Um, asked my board to help support me, but very quickly realized my board also thought I'd done something very wrong by saying what I believed and uh, went through two investigations. The first investigation, I was exonerated. There was an appeal. And then it started getting into very, very nasty, difficult, dangerous territory with my board using up huge vasts of funds from the company to per to persecute me, to witch hunt me. And the accusations became utterly insane. And there's just a point where I, I decided I had to stop what was happening and that, that that the thing inside of me that made me and that had made me build up a company from scratch to this level was the thing that I had to protect and that meant resigning the company and then I was going to absolutely sue them for discrimination and harassment and we had that lined up but they folded the company and they went they took it into insolvency so I couldn't anyway since then <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> yeah. So that's a summing up. Just quickly, you said about your dancers and you they asked you for your opinions before then. I know you said you're interested in the concept of transgenderism, but almost away from that, were there any rumblings amongst your dancers in terms of them being intolerant of views up until before that point? Or was that just a complete shock when they express expressed their disdain for what you said? Well, I, I hadn't realised, but on the audition form, there had been a, like a male, female, non-binary box to tick uh, because I hadn't done that. I just got the sort of like the photo and the link and the CV through to me. So I hadn't realised that this was being put in, this was sort of being encouraged by my management. And had I seen it, I'd have said, I don't want that because this is, it's not things to do about people's identities. Because at that point, I'd say I was still very liberal about it all. Um, it was about the fact that my Romeo and Juliet were sex-based roles. So that was really clear. Everything was very clearly, uh, it wasn't just an open call. It was like, you're coming to audition for a particular role that's based on the Shakespeare play. So that was very, it was a very clear argument for me, had I been asked. And yeah, there was, uh, you know, it was a moment where I was teaching Ballet, their technique wasn't very strong because of COVID and some of these young dancers hadn't even graduated properly. So I was trying to pull this diverse cast up for the big stage. You no, know, ballet has its rights and wrongs and I'm not a strict or nasty teacher, but there's a right and wrong and there's a discipline to it. And I know my stuff. I've, I've danced for more than 40 years. I've been professional for more than 25 years. You know, I know my stuff. I still perform as well, so I know, um, not to say I know everything, but you know, I, 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 I really love to look at people's bodies and to help them and to really articulate why, but also how they feel it. And there was definitely a sense of like, eyes being rolled that I couldn't understand. I was kind of like, I remember stopping at one point, just going, why am I asking you to point your feet in ballet? Tell me, tell me, you know, historically tell me anatomically tell me aesthetically tell me you know come on 
you guys are professionals. I'm not your teacher. I'm not your mum. You know, tell me. And then they were doing jumps from the corner. And normally we mix it, boys and girls. That's sort of the contemporary dance way. Whereas in ballet, it will be separated. And I looked around and there was, it was just the men from the corner. And so I made a comment. And I was trying, I was sort of being sarky that they were being rude. And I said, oh, so it's boys jumps then. And it was a sarky comment to say, have you not, it felt like the boys had pushed in. They were being sort of like aggressive, but I was pulled aside and a very tall, big male bodied person told me that I had misgendered them. And, and I, I, I was sort of like, mm, 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 really? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Really, you know, you're in a corridor, you're this much taller than me, I'm the boss and I'm misgendering you. Well, it's ballet, get over it, you know? So yeah, there was obviously, I've since found out there were there was a scorecard going on of my mistakes. And when you make a work with nine dancers to be, I remember thinking like, are you meant to like not see their sex? Are you meant to pretend it's not there? I remember like having a bit of a head fuck about it, if I'm allowed to swear. Yeah, yeah. And, and the thought of like trying to say, could they move over there? When you're trying to do nine people, very quickly, very delicate, very complex choreographies. You know, we were working to a Berlioz score, which speeds up, slows down, changes time signature. You know, I have to know that score inside out. I can't then also sort of be going, sorry, can I ask they, them to move to, you know it, it, it's 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 a very fast creative fun funny and I just remember like saying less and less and telling less and less stories about where this piece was coming from I just felt less and less comfortable in the studio which is awful but I did put that down to Covid it wasn't they they didn't like me <laughs> So I've, I've known you the work for a number of years because the first time I heard of you was actually about about the um, Commonwealth Games in my hometown because they had the closing ceremony for the gold um, for the Commonwealth Games in the Gold Coast in Australia. I mean, I think you did you help choreograph a dance sequence in Birmingham. Oh, I, choreograph I choreographed. Oh, I didn't help. I choreographed it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, choreographed it. Yeah. <laughs> and that's how I remember your name. So. Even then, and even though I'm not going to say, obviously, I'm not an expert in dance, but even then, I could see the freedom that you were trying to convey in that piece. Mm -hmm. So when what happened to you did happen to you, were you shocked from the backlash, not so, not just from other people, but also from fellow artists, when the whole nature of art is mainly a freedom to express how you want, how you want to express yourself? There's all sorts of layers and levels and stages that come with these kind of strange public events of you know somehow that you've done something terribly wrong by saying something that actually everybody knows it so it's a very bizarre situation I think at first like so many people reached out and found me because I was hard to get hold of because my management also hacked me and destroyed my email, my phone, tried to destroy my computers. So it was, it was a really scary time, the police had to get involved. Um, it was as if like, because the company had grown from me personally, just me running it, everything like my life and my company and my work were all ravel, sort of unraveled together, woven together deeply. But then when I resigned, it was almost as if Rosie K Dance Company management, of which, you know, what did they do actually? They 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 felt they had this ability to destroy me, everything. You know, there was a horrific two weeks where I was desperately trying to download all the photos of my son since birth, because they were disappearing on the iCloud, because they were just they were deleting, they're deleting all my dance, all my archive all my personal photos, deleting all my emails, 25 years. It was, it's, it's cruelty, God. I couldn't believe. And, and I, I thought they were mad. I thought they were like, I just genuinely thought they'd gone mad. But now having interviewed more than 40 other artists that have been through it, I can say to other artists, you know, like your story shocks me to the core. However, I do understand it. It has also happened to me, but I think, I think this culture of fear is 
more persuasive than I than I anticipated. I kind of felt like if I make a strong stand and I stand against this, and I've always been a bit of a maverick, maybe I'll stop it. You know, maybe I'll just stop it a little bit. People kind of take notice. And I think people did take notice actually, but I haven't been able to stop it so far, not just on my own, not yet. Um, and there's maybe, there's lots of reasons about that. We can maybe come to later. Cause I think that's been more now what I'm looking at more recently, what's, what's going on now. Yeah, it's, I mean, that part of the story, I didn't know. I mean, that's gone from anger. It's one thing to disagree with someone, but to then, even when you remove them from the situation, almost eviscerate their life as well. I mean, that's just an extreme. I mean, why would, what reasons do you think artists would do that? Because they've got what they've wanted. You're out your own company. So why therefore would they just choose to go further than that and actually eviscerate almost sections of your life? I mean, that just seems just mind blown to be honest. Well, that was my, that was my management. That was my co-director who, who, yeah, not not a very nice person. I mean, no respect, uh, no ability to separate the art from the person. You know, as if I, as if you know. I mean, I don't think criminals get treated the quite the same way. I hadn't done anything. I I hadn't done anything. <laughs> it's amazing. I was trying to warn young people of the dangers of this ideology, and very much saying what you believe in, you've been sold a lie. This is a lie. It's an absolute lie, but it's it's a very deliberate money-making lie. It's a pharmaceutical lie. It's an ideological lie. It's a, it's a denial of reality. It's a denial of your future. It's a denial of your fertility. It's a horrific, horrific thing. Um, and, and, you know, and I stand by what I said, um, even, though it was very painful to discover that <laughs> how controversial that was. I mean, I, I, I just sort of credit credit people gen generally with more sensitivity, more intelligence, more education. Is that part of the problem, a lack of education? Just, just a lack of education to actually debate and be objective? Or is it more deeper than that? It's a very pernicious ideology that particularly that no, no across the arts there's loads of minefields there's loads and loads and loads the gender ideology one is a very specific one and it's kind of like a multi-headed hydra people can say you know it gets into all sorts of different avenues of culture and i i, I can't quite understand how it became so attractive and so persuasive to young people there's lots of elements, people talk about it being a religion. I don't think it's a religion. I think it's probably closer to a cult. Mm -hmm. I think there's a, there's a, so I remember somebody saying it's beautifully put, that it's a Lord of the Flies generation. They've been allowed to grow up with a sort of social media and private networks and bullying going on that their parents just had no idea about. Mm -hmm. And that's led them to kind of strange, strange beliefs, strange behaviours. I suppose this links a little bit with all my work that I did with conspiracy theory. You know, when young people believe nothing, not only do they get very disillusioned, they blame the adults for like this lack of safety, for this lack of future. And they do attach themselves to strange ideas. And I would say this gender ideology is massively funded by billionaires. It's very, very deliberately pushed through society, like something like, if you've read the Denton's report, very deliberately pushed through society and uh, with no debate. And that's been important. And it's kind of like dealing with young people who have been indoctrinated into a cult. Mm. And so you can't talk to them as rational, uh, intelligent, functioning, uh, debatable kind of fellow humans. You actually have to look at deprogramming techniques, which I worked. I worked with deprogrammers with MK Ultra. I, I looked at all of this, um, and it's a long, very complex process, and you need very, very trained experts to do it. But one of the things that I remember, I'm not an expert. What I remember was they said that um, the way to get past the cult is you have to ask one, one very, very good question, one very good question that goes deep, deep into their brain 
and sits there. And even when they're asleep and when they're not thinking about it, the subconscious brain will be working on it. So it happened to me once I was at an event and a very angry young woman came up, eyes blazing, and obviously clearly very angry with me. Like, I, I disagree with everything you believe in. I was like, okay, fine, you know, I'll take it. What is it I believe, like, help me understand. And there's something that I was kind of like, not quite sure if that is what I believe, to be honest. So I said, well, that's fine. Okay, that's not what I believe, but I'm not gonna tell you what I believe, but I wanna ask one question. Will you let me ask one question? Mm, yeah, all right. I said, do you believe that all the advances of technology, science, medicine, do you really believe totally, 100%, that humans can change sex? And that's the seed you see, that's just the seed, because they're so got at this level of trans women are women and be kind, and you're a bigot. Actually, if you go right down to the very root of it, no, humans can't change sex, and we know that. Mm. And so every time we kind of say, that's not a man, that's a woman. They, they, they need to, there needs to be something in their head going, actually, that is a man. That is a man. That is a man that wants in a woman's space, so it's no longer a woman's space. Yeah, I mean, I come of it from a um, sports background where that's, I mean, it's a major issue in sports at the moment. Um, and you're getting some governing bodies are starting now to change their rules, but you got others who are still very slow to change their rules. Um, in regards to, even though the biological differences are so obvious. And it's interesting what you talk about, this whole thing is a cult, not just what you talk about transgender, but just the whole, I hate the word, but the whole woke ideology, so to speak, because I've been listening to a lot about the Salem trials, and that was like almost a type of mass hysteria, but I would say yeah. the difference now is like you say, you have governments funding it, and you have governments leading it. And I'm just wondering, I can't understand why, gov what benefit a government not just british governments but just western governments in whole would have of this because it just seems back to front i don't know what you think about that well i mean because i came at this from the transhumanist place this whole kind of like meshing of humanity with machine and humanity with ai that's that's how i sort of came into this so i sort of came into it to the, from the more what's what's just coming through now and then I read a lot of Jennifer Billick. She's got a really good uh, podcast and uh, blog called The Eleventh Hour. And, and, and just trying to sort of like filter it all through, through, through my experience of anthropology and mental health and the body. I think we're selling our bodies back to, we, we are being sold our bodies back to us as component parts. So there is a kind of like super Descartian kind of like schism of the likes I've never seen that's almost says we can live in an AI world where we're just a sort of brain yeah. and this from neck down is a meat sack of which there are certain parts are more val valuable than others and the most valuable part of our meat sacks is our fertility and our ability to procreate and so there's something around the technologies of the brain and the virtual reality and the AR, AI going one way and the body coming over here to be dehumanized. It's disgusting, mm -hmm. it's useless, it's obese or it's withering away. But we can sell you either your fertility, your eggs, your sperm, your womb, your surrogacy, that's going to be the most valuable thing about this meat sack. So I think I think it's just a huge commodification of 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 of, of what was a, a Western split is now being monetized. Yeah, like I say, this separation, like I say, with the body, almost seeing his body as just a thing and not like the whole. It doesn't include like the mind and the body, and we just see each other sexy. So I just think it's. Obviously, I think it's incredibly misogynistic as well. And yet, it's, like you said at the beginning, it's almost this erasure of women from history. Like you're saying, some of your heroines, um, heroines are. And it's almost with this, we've almost forgotten about those. It's almost like saying, well, that happened there, but this is like a new age and we should forget about those. And because the way we define, or some people define women is different, seeing different as what well they define them, we should almost erase those, which I think is actually rather dangerous. Well, I'm only like the sort of first generation of women in my family that have really 
chosen exactly what I wanted to do, like raised my own money to do it, run my own businesses, bought my own car, bought my own house. You know, my mum definitely, you know, had a, had a, had a, still has an amazing career actually, but, but there were certain sacrifices she had to make as a sort of like, you know, second income or home, um, home rear or whatever. And my grandmother certainly, certainly had a thwarted life in terms of like never being able to fulfill her potential intellectually or, or you know for her whole life so and I haven't even had a full life yet you know <laughs> I'm only in my middle middle aged and kind of thinking oh, I'm just just starting to get there and then no so these are very very hard fought for rights very hard my mum's just writing a book on a leading woman from the suffrage movement called Crystal McMillan, who who again has been sort of forgotten from history. And she's really funny because I'll tell her about things that are going on now. And she goes, oh, that's very funny. That's just like when the women took the petition to the League of Nations in 1911. And she'll tell me all these stories. And it's like, so it's really, really similar. And all these like, oh, this person's got too much of an ego or this is the cult of personality. And it's like, every time the women brought a brilliant argument, the men would say, oh, that's brilliant, but that's not actually that's not actually the question we ask. They'd go away and they'd frantically do the next bit and they'd go, yeah, no, sorry, we've actually changed the criteria now. And so that's why it took, like it took decades for women to win the right to vote. And then here we are in 2023, you know, yeah, yeah, with, with, with you know, women not, you know, Elizabeth Fry brought in the Prisons Act 200 years ago. I think it was the anniversary this year or last year. And now we've got male body people in women's prisons and it's really bad in Scotland. It's really bad. Yeah. What, what differences have you seen between Scotland and um, England? I know there are yeah. different. I mean, I have, I have a friend of mine who, who used to live in Scotland and moved back to England because of it. What differences have you seen, certainly in terms of not just how art is expressed, but also how art is treated from a legal sense, what you can and can't say? Yeah, I, well, it sort of breaks my heart because um, because I'm originally from Scotland and then we moved back there when I was a teenager and I was so inspired by both Scottish playwrights, like studying um, the equivalent of a level drama in Scotland. You know, just so political, so funny, uh, you know, very working class, very accessible, you know, theatre theater and art being part of life. Mm. You know, like Glasgow Girls, the Glasgow Boys, you know, like that it was something like, yeah, you had to be super amazing at it, but you didn't have to be posh or it was, a, it was something like special, but attainable and accessible. And then also I was very lucky to be in Edinburgh during the Brian McMaster phase of Edinburgh Festival. So I saw Pina Bausch as a teenager, Mathieu Monnier, some of the best dance in the world was coming through Edinburgh in the 90s. And and I saw it, I saw it all, it was incredible. So I've always had, and you know, Edinburgh Festival, I made my name at Edinburgh Festival. It's just always felt, I, I know there's two Scotlands, you know, there's the kind of like harder conservative, you know, with a small C, mm -hmm. slightly bullying culture, because I had an English accent. So they're like, oh, you speak English. I'm like, no, but I'm Scottish. They're like, no, you speak English. So it's <laughs> kind of like a tough culture, but then also this like amazing, Cult, like culture, like there isn't the same class system, cultures for all. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I stay really in touch with, uh, most of my family are up there. Um, it's got such a strong women's movement and they're working so hard and that's really pulled women together. I did go to parliament just uh, at Chris, before Christmas last year when they were bringing in the vote you know, and it was it was really shocking to see how despised we were as women to be concerned about ourselves and our rights. We were despised by the security guards, by Nicola Sturgeon. And then the way that I mean, I've been spoken to quite a lot of Scottish artists and arts leaders, and I mean, they're in a state of trauma. I mean, they're, there's no two ways about it. They're absolutely, you know, people that have lost their entire livelihoods, had to move out of cities they loved, lost, you know, their reputations that have been built over 50 years. It's shocking, shocking. The misogyny of it, you're right, it's shocking. Yeah, and you talked about accessibility, which to me seems to be getting worse and worse, certainly for the working class. 
Like I, I was born in the nineteen eighties, but I remember hearing stories about the kitchen sink dramas, both on TV and in theatre, and that all seems to have gone now. So, where did that go? Because up until say the nineties, there used to be still that accessibility. Whereas now, just to view art, apart from museums, most museums are free, but just to view art, it's it's, it's very expensive. Like, I've never seen a West End play, and I'll, I'll probably never work because I just can't afford it. So where? What, what happened in the intervening decades to make art less accessible for people? So I'm I'm the very last year that got a government grant by my local authority to go to a conservatoire. So you had to go through this like massive audition process and from, you know, very talented dancers from all across the country would audition for London Contemporary. If you got through and you were good enough, you got your fees paid. Now I still had to like somehow live in London and eat and all that stuff which is horrific but I got my fees paid and so when I got to dance school it was like a super diverse room full of people who were all insanely intimidatingly talented and we're all kind of like wow how do we get here but that was the last year and then of course from the mid 90s onwards there were small amounts of fees right up till we get to 2010 where it's nine grand a year you know plus plus all your expenses. So, you know, who who would go into a career in acting or the visual arts or dance where you have so little job security, so little chance of like hitting, you know, that, that, that top sort of successful band. You would also, who's, so, so what are the fee paying things going on that's making it sort of less attractive to anybody that can't, that's gonna come out with 60, 70,000 pounds of debt with a degree that makes it very hard to earn a regular wage at any level. At the same time as that, a lot of the grassroots stuff was drying up. So even when I was little, I could go to a ballet class for just like a couple of pounds. I think the whole sort of like the training, dance, music provision in school, that's all dried up as well. Um, there's a lot of like, commonalities through music and dance are just that we need to start really young really young to understand music to like the whole kind of like physicality of learning the really complex techniques so by the time you're 18 you're ready to start like absolutely going for it or even younger um I was just speaking to several quite few experts in the classical musical music field and the only young people that are going to music conservatoires come from private schools because yeah. they're, they're the only people that have enough um, tuition to be good enough. So so that's now really hitting through the workforce as well, that that generation's come through. And so I think you can say also that's that means that they're coming through also with these, what I would, you know, what's been called luxury beliefs. They can afford to have these beliefs. And it's just really bizarre because like I've had to... <laughs> Not, not like I'm salt of the earth or anything like that, but, you know, from, from 20 years living in Birmingham, you know, I started out, you know, in community centres, in schools, weekly classes, you know, like really tough, tough stuff, getting people involved in dance that probably didn't want to get involved in dance, you know, and worked with so many different, like, religions and, and environments. And, like, you end up being, like, incredibly open-minded because you're like, okay, you know, I'm not going to talk about the politi politics. I just want to talk about the dance. Just want to like use this as the thing that we can then find a commonality rather than siloing ourselves out. Um, so I'm of that old school that used to feel, you know, I might have lost some of my enthusiasm at the moment, but you know, the arts really can bring people together under a common humanity. But I think even the artists that are coming out now probably have very different life experiences. Yeah, I remember listening to an interview um, with someone and they were talking about it in terms of script writers, because it was in terms of script writers for films, because they were saying that the, a lot of films today, they, in their opinion, wasn't, weren't very good because they're normally remakes or sequels or just really crappy films. And he said that one of the problems is writers back in the day, so people like Oliver Stone, all these other film directors and um, authors, they were writing from having a lot of experience because a lot of them were high and living through that era. A lot of them were men who had gone to war as well. 
And so they were able to bring that different perspective into their writing and it showed in terms of how they and how the writing and the characters. And I imagine that's the same for a lot of art as well in that currently, like you say, you get a lot of upper, um, upper middle or upper class into dance and they're not taking the time to actually experience life from all breadths of um, all angles and it's shown in their work. So if say they're trying to depict someone who's, I don't know, homeless, it's going to be very few of a homeless person, which I imagine they wouldn't be able to comprehend, if you understand what I mean. There's that, but I think there's also like an incredibly risk averse culture yeah. across all the arts. I was really shocked recently to hear that Werner Herzog, the really famous German documentary maker, he's had to pay himself for his last two films. He can't get funding or support. It's like, you know, multi award winning film director. Um, and it, it's absolutely right. If you, if you go through London, you'll notice that every sort of poster for a show, if it's not an already existing show, it is existing IP uh, intellectual property. So yeah. it will be an adaptation of like another film or another book. Um, I'm finding that like people just don't have any appetite for new work whatsoever at all. They, they don't want to take that risk. Theatres are in a difficult position because the cost of living has meant that their costs have skyrocketed. They're safer to put in musical theatre, but musical theatre has a particular audience that actually, if they're gonna spend that money, they wanna get really drunk and they wanna <laughs> sing along and they wanna like get a bit like Larry. And yeah. so there's this whole problem going on with um, behaviour in theatres. Oh, um, and it's it's the same I heard in cinemas actually, that that, You've got the Grey Pound, which has got the money, but they want to go and see films in perfect conditions, but they need to attract the younger generation, but they're going to be eating on their phones and talking all the way through. And you can't have these two audiences in the same cinema. You can't. Mm. So so you've got, you've got a really difficult situation. How do you keep these, you know, it seems to be like a sort of attack on communal human experiences, you know, like like communal cinema or communal theatre. Um, they're making that harder and harder to make sense financially. And so there's then an aversion to having anything that might be considered difficult, which means art. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. Art is difficult <laughs> by its very nature. It isn't just entertaining. It can be very entertaining, but it isn't its prime motive. Um, so finding that audience that's willing to come out in the dark, you know, and and pay for a ticket that feels quite a lot of money now, and we're all used to sitting at home in our in our pajamas, you know, it's it, we're facing a tricky thing. And, and if you do bother to go, and somebody is haranguing you with a message about it could be climate change or race or gender or anything like, but like not not presenting a nuanced and complex piece like you say from experience, but like you know lecturing you and everybody's a cipher for something else i mean i i can't bear that sort of stuff i just turn off immediately and i'd be very upset about spending 25 quid on a ticket for it obviously you've been you have this interesting dance and you see dance around the world is this a problem mainly most places around the world or is this a problem tend to be in western countries because certainly from like a book um, a literature point of view and a a TV drama film point of view, the most interesting work is happening in mainland Europe and in, say, South Korea as well, non-English speaking countries where this hasn't reached yet, where they're doing very, not just diverse, but very, really original, um, thought-provoking work. This seems to be more of a Western Europe and American problem than a whole worldwide problem. Well, yeah, it's interesting you say that. So um, after launching Freedom in the Arts, like, what was it, about two and a half weeks ago, I've had a lot of conversations, uh, mostly you're right, English speaking world. So Ireland, US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, that's that's where these news stories are coming to me. I, I'm getting, I'm finding out what's been going on. You know, you sort of read about it, don't you, in, on Twitter or in a newspaper, but when you actually get to speak to these people and find out what's happened to their festival or their company or their careers like it's still really super shocking <laughs> I'm, still sh I'm still shocked by it mm -hmm. even though I'm like, I'm like oh yeah that happened to me but I'm still shocked still shocked um yeah uh, my work does get me around a bit and I 
feel that your audiences really have come back and they're really appreciative and they're really enthusiastic and so that's brilliant and you're right there are there are bubbles of really interesting things going on in the east and far east absolutely yeah yeah and and you're right it's just not it's not taken hold the whole it's a very american kind of identity politics kind of stuff you kind of answered this question a little bit at the start, but when we talk about um, other artists and what they've been through, and I appreciate it, and it, can, it must be hard for other artists for if they've been through what you've been through, it must be hard. But also, not just in art, but this whole ideology as well, there just seems to be a lot of cowardice. Like, there seems to be less people with a backbone. I'm just wondering, where were the people with a backbone gone? Because... Really, even senior figures really could have stood up and said, actually, no, we're not going to take this nonsense anymore, but they never did. So I don't know why is that why is that the case? So my my th my theory, my take on this, my, my little experience of 25 years in the arts, is that it was much more common in the 60s and through the 70s for the artists themselves to also be the artistic directors or the chief execs. So you had like, you know, Peter Hall in charge of the National Theatre in his 30s. So, so, so you were a practicing artist, you understood like the vulnerabilities, the difficulties, um, the, the passion, the integrity, the discipline, but you were trusted to run big organizations. And that slowly, 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 slowly being eroded. 20 years ago, I think there was only one arts administration degree course in the country. I think now there's hundreds, arts administration, curatorial practice, um, uh, producing for theatre, producing for dance, art and, art and activism, or oh, that's my new bugbear. Um, so, so what's grown, particularly since the Blair years, is a big bureaucratic, technocratic class. Now, yeah. as the Arts Council sort of grew, they became risk, less risk, um, less just like, oh, here's your money and off you do. They wanted more and more checks and balances. So they also demanded that there was a sort of bureaucratic class that could do that sort of work for the Arts Council. Now, what they're in fact doing is they're all paying themselves, you know, salary, holiday pay, sick pay, all your know, pensions, all these things. And what they're doing is they're creaming off more and more money and at the same time, the artist has to start answering more and more and more criteria. And the artists aren't stupid. They, they want that money to do their work, but they don't realise that they're being influenced and influenced and influenced and influenced, so that over those 20 years, they stop just doing what the hell they like because they want to do it. And they start making work that responds to climate change or responds to this, that and the other. They're trying to fulfil the criteria and they're becoming less and less powerful, but more and more cowed into the system and so what you what you've got is is just a lot of very 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 lowly paid low power low status artists very competitive scrabbling for small funds and status and then a big chunk of middle management who sit in offices with all the power and say well i'm sorry your work doesn't suit a uh, season this year and our curatorial curatorial choice is not to have people with your hair or, you know, I don't know what, what it is, you know, they can make up their criteria. And then you have some very senior, senior leaders who I think just have like really cushy jobs, really cushy jobs. And if they just hang on in there and stay tight, they'll hopefully get a good pension and maybe an OBE. And, you know, maybe all the values that they did believe in, they just think, oh, yeah, oh God, do I really want to fall out of my entire work staff? So they're not really there for the artists anymore. They're there to hold an institution to not fall into any disrepute. So the people you describe them, would you say they're using art as a way of opening doors? You know, like you say, they're not necessarily interested in the art, but if you're, say, head of a certain institution that's well-renowned, then you might open doors elsewhere in that sense. Art's always been used to a means to an end. Don't, don't get me wrong. I, I think they do... They do care about the arts. They do care about the art forms. Uh, there's a reason why a lot of people my age, so Generation X, aren't in these positions of power, because we saw 
what was happening and we went no I'd rather be creative and artistic and run my own business than run a building an institution and all and so the, I think I think we we're already a bit of a funny small generation generation X's that we still we <laughs> We still feel like we might just be about to get there when we should have got there at least 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, and we're sort of sandwiched and the millennials have just jumped straight over and gone, right, we're going to change everything and put in DEI policy and HR policy and microaggressions and you name it. And 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 where the generation just goes, oh, I just don't like any of this at all. So you mentioned D U um, DEI there. Um, how has that affected the arts recently? Personally, I'm not a fan of it in general. I just feel it's very patronising. And I think if you do have a problem in terms of certain groups not having, uh, being in the arts, then you put in policies in place that might minimise it, although you're always not going to have an equal percentage of groups. But what is your thoughts on the whole DUI policy and arts in, in arts in general? So so, so I could probably do like a whole off-air sort of analysis as to what's really going on there. But what's happening in the arts is I think it comes from a good place. I think that people think, oh, right, this is the next modern thing. I don't, I think they're quite naive and don't realise the words don't quite mean what you think they mean. They mean mm -hmm. something else. My take, I'm being a little bit careful, because I don't want to scare everybody that works in the arts off, because I do think they do do it for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. But actually what we've got are very robust and good, decent laws in this country around equality and the Equality Act 2010. And then you have certain serious policy frameworks that you need to stick to, including safeguarding for children yeah. and you know, protecting against harassment, intimidation. What people are doing is adding in things that are above and beyond the law and actually, if they ever, God forbid, went to a tribunal, a judge could look at these policies that do not refer to the actual law of the lands as being discriminatory. So I think we could be sleepwalking into like really poor policy when good policy actually exists if you stuck to it and understood it. And that there is no hierarchy of protected characteristics. It, that they're, they're simply there in order to make sure that we can thrive. It's not there to try and balance out historical injustices. And I think that's a social justice kind of take on it. It's actually the, the laws to protect all of us equally. Yeah, it's interesting. I was reminded um, earlier this week of a writer's conference I went to, and there was, I can't remember the guy's name, but he was a children's author. He'd been a children's author for 25 years up to that point. And he was talking about how much writers are paid. And he held up a piece of paper, ripped it in half, ripped it in half again and said, this is how much I'm pay what I was paid when I first started, i.e. 25%. And he got the same piece of paper, ripped a corner off it and said, this is how much I'm paid now. It's very, it's pittance. It's nothing. And why, one of the things he decided to do was he decided to self-publish because he thought the returns would be better. And I'm just, I'll lead on to my next point, which is, is one way around this, to encourage people to create more independent art because we seem to have the platforms for it more. So for instance, YouTube, yes, they have their own algorithms, but you can post things, um, art on there. Like I've seen comedians post things on there. As a writer, I could um, write a book and self-publish it. And I appreciate with certain, it's easier with certain art forms than others, but is that one way around this whole censorious and changing nature of modern art? It's actually go independent, instead of relying on institutions. Um, yeah, I mean, like the most expensive art form. <laughs> it's so it's so expensive because you need to you need this you need the space. The space has to be really like proper, equipped. You know, sprung floors, warm. You need time. You know, like you need lots of people. You need a lot of time because you make everything from scratch. There is no, there is maybe ballet vocabulary, but the work I make has no effect no no language you have to make the language up never mind make the stories up then you know it's not terribly you know it does account you know have 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 had shows that have sold out but it doesn't always you know it's not a guarantee um 
I suppose I'm slightly one. Yes, I, I think it's not quite as simple as just say like the new alternative media, you know, that where, where there's a real need and demand and a kind of quite quick and not cheap, I wouldn't say it's cheap, but quite a quick way to get information, alternative information out through new channels, you know, like trigonometry or, or, or such like, um, or podcasting, whatever. Yeah. The arts have always been very collaborative and we do have these like fabulous institutions we do I just sort of want them to kind of I think like you said earlier have a bit of a backbone and you know really protect their mission a little bit more I you know I still I still believe there's hope however in the meantime um I think so many artists have been like if they're not cancelled they feel very lonely and full of fear and dread so you know setting up something like freedom in the arts half of it is just to connect people just to build a network of other like-minded artists who you may or may may not love each other's work, but at least you know you could try to work with each other without getting cancelled by each other. You know, it could be a like-minded bunch of talented people coming together. So that's part of the aim, to to build new networks. Because like everything, we're stronger together. We're stronger, the, the more of us there are, the stronger we are. Well, I was going to ask you about Freedom in the Arts. Obviously, you said he set it up officially two and a half weeks ago at the time of recording this interview. So you've kind of explained it there, but what were why you decide to set it up? Because obviously you had the issues with what happened with your own story, and then you've brought this on as well. So why did you what made you think actually I need to set up some sort of organization to help artists instead of just offering them advice like here, there, here, there when you can? So um Denise Farmy um, was a relationship manager at the Arts Council, 15 years experience, also a trade union representative, and she worked in visual arts. And um, somebody put me in touch with her when I was going through my absolute nightmare, and she really helped me, and she was amazing. And it turned out she'd been raising issues around women being bullied and harassed for what's known now as gender critical beliefs for quite a while and raising it at senior management level and even whistleblowing levels. And it had been being ignored within the Arts Council. Anyway, then she she went through a horrific thing last year where she was um, harassed and intimidated by a sort of workplace group, um, by the, you know, that was public to the whole of the Arts Council staff and senior leaders didn't do anything to protect her or not enough at the time. And she took them to a tribunal and she won. And we were both invited to speak at the House of Lords. We just obviously stayed in touch and talked quite a lot together about what was going on, just like figuring out together what was happening. And we went to the House of Lords, two very different cases, very different stories. And we were with the academic Laura Favora as well. Very, very incredible, amazing woman, academic. We'd all been cancelled. And we were there, very senior lords, including somebody that used to be the head of the criminal prosecution service and they were just like but this is illegal and we were like we know (laughs) we (laughs) know but it still happened to us (laughs) and we were kind of saying look it can happen to us you who are all at you know top of our game senior people well respected good reputations happened to us like can you imagine what it's like for women lower down younger it's horrific. So me and Denise sat afterwards and we just went, it's, it was just one of those, if not us, who we're not gonna be carried by this. So really since then, we've spent a lot of time behind the scenes, a lot of interviews, a lot of research. I, 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 I was kind of just trying to really figure out what was going on across all the sectors. And then we have, th- we have three aims. One, to protect artists. So we support. Um, we can give like just normal advice around what what might be happening to them and sort of like say you're not going mad this is what happened and then we can signpost them to good or free legal advice Um, the other is to really articulate like publicly uh, why the arts are so important to society it's not just a little add-on and a frill it's really integral to a healthy democratic society and we need to really fight for that and show why that matters. Um, And then the third part is like hold institutions to their missions, which is, you know, to support artists, bringing out the best art, 
for excellence, um, maybe to be more impartial, like not to take a stand on political issues. And then we really want to lobby politicians and funders as well, because some, a lot of this is top down and uh, we need to point out what effect that's having lower down. Okay. Um, a bit more about yourself and your own work now as well. Um, one of the things I was interested in was Seven Shoulders about this MK Ultra the play you did, because I'm interested in psychology, so I heard about that as well. What was the inspiration uh, for you deciding to do a play on that? On on MK Ultra, yeah, yeah. Um, well, it, it was the third part of this trilogy I was doing. It was all like <laughs> things you're not allowed to talk about at a dinner party. Funny enough, um, <laughs> so, the <f> <laughs> so yeah, I've got a, I've got a new trilogy. Uh, the first one was War, um, which became Five Soldiers. The second one was Religion, which became this fantastic piece called There Is Hope, and the third part was meant to be politics. And I was looking at a modern interpretation of 1984. But then through that, I just, um, it was actually Jimmy Savile's death and then everything that came out. I started looking at more like cover-ups and um, hidden messages. And I just really went down um, the rabbit hole because other, other shows I've done like lots of big field research like joining an infantry battalion or going to India and China for there is hope but I was pregnant during the time of that one so I was mostly at home and online so I kind of found this new territory you know like down underneath and discovered like the real cover-ups the really really nasty ones of which MK Ultra is a real CIA mm -hmm. massively funded brainwashing um huge what would you call it program Massive program, conditioning, um, experimentation on children, young people, people without consent, um, horrific experiments on people's minds and bodies. Um, but the conspiracy theories, they didn't stop in the 70s, which is when they said they did, but they carried on and they collaborated with Disney and all these pop stars were uh, that were massive, say, when would that be? You know, like 10 years ago, like Lady Gaga, Katy Perry, Britney Spears, of course, is like the sort of the goddess. Um, these pop stars were spreading a dark brainwashing message through their music. And the message was being spread through symbols, possibly satanic, but certainly um, al 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 alchemy type symbol symbolism, mm -hmm. esoteric Im imagery. And I'm, I'm really into my alchemy esoteric sort of history of the world. So it's like this mix of like pop culture, politics, conspiracy theory, alchemy, gnostic religions. I, I just like, it's just so rich. And, and, and so then I went and I interviewed loads and loads of young people, uh, teenagers and young people about the Illuminati, about conspiracy theory and about where they thought society was going in politics. And that was when they were saying these like really quite staggering things to me, like, well, you know, we don't believe in the politicians, we don't believe the news, we don't believe the media. So if we don't believe in anything, do we have to just believe in ourselves or do we make it up? And so it did feel like there was this pro precursor, because just when it premiered, Trump came, came in, Brexit happened, suddenly everyone that had been saying I was bonkers for looking at conspiracy theories, suddenly it was like, here you go. Yeah. It does affect, affects everything these beliefs are affecting everything now. And now yeah. you, can, you can just say, oh, it's disinformation, fake news. You know, you smear it immediately. Yeah, it's been like that through the centuries. There's a guy who used to be an advisor to Elizabeth I called John D. Yeah, I know John D. Uh, yeah, and I remember, I, I only heard of him about a couple of months ago. Alchemist. And, and I remember reading about him thinking, well, he's supposed to be a psychic. And I thought, yeah, right. And then you look at what he actually got right. And I'm thinking, gosh, the guy was really accurate and so on and so forth. So, yeah, I, I do look at conspiracy theories. I'm not saying I believe in all of them, but it's interesting to look at that. And as you say now, we're very dismissive of news. Like more people seem to get their news from social media, especially the last few weeks with what's happened yeah. with the um, conflict in the Middle East now than what they're getting um, on the actual news. And it yeah. just seems fun. Cause, and that shows, again, a lack of trust in our institutions as well. So I'm going to get, like, I've, I've never talked about this uh, on any podcast yet or anything, but, like, my new favourite one is Tartaria. Do you know about Tartaria? 
No, no, it's Tatum. Oh, Mind Unveiled on YouTube and Tartarian History. You're going to have so much fun. Mud Floods, Orphan Trains. Oh, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. And now my, my son is nine and he's now completely sick of it. He's like, don't say it's Tartarian. It's like you start looking at architecture and towers and churches and looking for like basements and it honestly it's a, it's it's such a it's such a fun one it's really good it's tartarian history yeah I'll definitely have a look at that because i'm currently looking at the whole i think it's a bronze age because i think graham hancock has a theory about that where he thinks the technology i think it's a bronze age where he thinks the technology they had then was as good as it was in victorian times but then there's some like world ending events which basically destroyed that civilization and had oh, to stand yeah, it's, it's, yeah. the great floods the cataclysms yeah yeah there's some i like i i, I got into graham hancock a long time ago it's, it's funny because it's like sometimes it's like escapism for me it's like really fun and then other times it suddenly makes you really <laughs> anxious like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like oh i don't know if i believe even like anything anymore <laughs> yeah okay that's enough it's not fun anymore read a book <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah i mean i do get into it and it's like it's a nice way of just speaking to people like that because and that's one good thing about the internet like you can speak to various people about these sorts of things whereas before it would have been very hard to find people like that <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but finally, um, what else have you got planned with own works? Have you got freedom of in the arts? But in terms of your own work, what do you have uh, planned? Do you have any more plays planned? Do you have any more ideas? Or do you want to explain that to our audience? I do, I do. So I've got quite a lot on actually. Um, I'm developing Five Soldiers for TV, for like a TV short film. Um, I'm working with soldiers on that as well. So like both the dance and the kind of personal experiences. Um, I've got a tour uh, opening in May with Fantasia, which is this beauty, it's, it's all about beauty and joy. It's just beauty and joy in music uh, with a trio of female dancers. And that's in a double bill with my solo adult female dancer. So hopefully we'll be, we'll be dancing away next year. And then I've got like, I've got like two or three shows, but one that's like funded that I'm developing, which is more kind of like, your Rosie Kay new kind of funny shocking piece um I'm I'm, I'm just sort of like hoping theatres will get a bit braver <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely definitely hopefully fingers crossed and I have to say it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you we've dived into art and conspiracies and whatnot I will leave a link to Freedom in the Arts in the description in this video because obviously it'll go up on YouTube and it also go up on Spotify as well Right. Could you leave a link for um, k2co.com? So that's um, k-2co.com. Because if you subscribe to my newsletter this month, you get access to watch Adult Female Dancer, which is a, we specially shot it, 30 minute solo. You can watch online for free. Um, and that's like, a, it's my only, and will will be, I think, my only autobiographical solo. Okay. So I guess lots of awards and blah 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 blah. <laughs> it's good, it's good, it's good. <laughs> I'll definitely add that in the description in, in the description as well. Again, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and thank you so much for um having the time to speak to me today. Oh, thank you for inviting me, Chris. I'm sorry it took so long, but I'm glad we've done it now. It's really it's so nice to meet you. And it are you a are you a brummy then? Yes, yeah, the accent tends to give it away, yeah, but um yeah, I've been here most of my life. But yeah, it's been a um interesting time for the city as well. Like we're basically bankrupt. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, yeah. but yeah, it's been interesting. But again, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. And thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. You're welcome. All right, take care. Cheers. Bye.